Close you down. Good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to the Future Leaders Forum Seminar, Innovation Through Civil Engineering Towards Sustainability. Um, to kick off with, I think, um, just to make sure we're on time, so as other speakers would know the time allocations, um, we will probably have a quick um, minutes from uh, Sahil Bashir, if he's online. And uh, are you there, Sahil? Okay. Um, so the future leaders have been have been uh, in uh, progress uh, for a few years now, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, whilst helping them as a uh, as a co-chair for the last few years, and um, they have done a marvelous job in relation to moving forward with uh, their activities. And this technical seminar, the Future Leaders Forum Seminar, is another activity that they've done and they have prepared themselves. So um, I think um, the um, couple of things that are listed in the program, um, I'm not sure whether the slide goes on there or not about the program, but certainly there's a couple of items that they want to, uh, it's a first, I suppose, uh, whilst, in, whilst in Jeju, the launching of their first ATEC FLC newsletter and the launching of the ATEC FLC website that is on pro uh, work in progress at the moment. Um, I'm just going to request if um, the current FLC chair, Suraj Gautam, if he's online. Are you online, Suraj? Suraj is here. Yes, uh, Suraj is audible. You're on mute, Suraj. Well, it's great to see some of the future leaders online there, including the previous chair, Ashi. Is Suraj still muted? Well, let's, let me just carry on, and if Suraj comes in, just uh, say a few words, Suraj. Um, so the outline agenda and uh, introduction of the future leaders presenters today was to be undertaken by Suraj Gautam. As I said, he's the FLC chair, and he's based in Nepal. Yeah, the first speaker is um, Dr. Ji Shu Kim, uh, University of Seoul, and he will be int uh, presenting on the introduction of a virtual laboratory for developing building and construction materials. And the um, second speaker is also from Seoul National University, sorry, he's from Seoul National University, and he will be presenting on load transfer behavior of a load distributed compression anchor, Dr. Gyu Bom Shin, Dr. Shin. The third speaker will be presenting on an overview about water 4.0 virtual. And uh, that will be done by engineer Cho Su Cho Su Su A, Federation of Minima, Myanmar Engineering Society at the University of Seoul. And then we will have a question and answer session that will be facilitated by Madison Elliott, colleague from Australia, if she's online. And then we'll close with an, a few comments from Suraj Gautam from Nepal. So if we have um, Dr. Shin from the University of Seoul, um, he can start the first presentation. 
Ravindra said, am I audible? Oh, okay. Sorry, Dr. Shin. Um, Suraj, welcome. You're online. Um, if you'd like to, I've just mentioned the newsletter and the website. Maybe say a few more things and uh, just a brief, a uh, few comments in relation to the uh, colleagues who are online. And, uh, and you've been part of today's discussions and the future leaders. So um, just take a few minutes to, to introduce the newsletter and the website, um, if you can share something. But um, yeah, a few minutes and then we'll get Dr. Shin, uh, Dr. Kim on the stage. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Salendra. Um, apologies for Kim. <laughs> I want to take a few moments before we start. So hello, namaste, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we are having uh, a FLF technical seminar. So first of all, we are very much thankful to our uh, host, uh, KSC, for providing us this opportunity uh, for our future leaders uh, to give this uh, platform. And uh, I would also like to thank our FLF coaches, Shalindra sir and uh, Sohel sir for the overall uh, support. And uh, this has been a, a very exciting journey. And so lucky to have future leaders from all the country, uh, from 16 countries. And uh, as I'm not wrong, we'll be having uh, two more future leaders from our new member economy. So they, uh, this is gonna be very interesting. So AK Future Leaders is a group of uh, civil engineers below 35 years of age. And uh, we are working especially on creating a sustainable future leaders forum, provide, uh, promoting a diverse and inclusive culture for young civil engineers and uh, creating avenues for the professional development and international technical collaborations among civil engineers in AKIC member economies. So uh, we, are, we do have now um, a, a new future leaders committee uh, where I'm working as a chair and I have um, uh, other members who are supporting me. So I won't go into details here because uh, time is also running out. So uh, we are also uh, renewing uh, some of the uh, AK uh, future leaders because we are uh, bounded by the age factor as well. So uh, yeah, we are uh, working on uh, developing uh, the four working groups are working actively in uh, handling different types of activities uh, that uh, includes the activity management, newsletter, research and documentation, website, and so on. So also we are also uh, promoting a diverse uh, inclusive leadership. And yeah, we are conducting so many webinars and also uh, publishing the newsletters. And this is what we have been doing. So this is the roadmap for our first three months. And today we are here conducting this um, uh, webinar, uh, technical seminar. So I would like to now focus on to that. Uh, I, I wanna skip this right now. So these are the international webinars which AKIC FLC has been doing in the past. And uh, today, uh, we in this, I would like to take this forum as an opportunity to launch our website. So may I request uh, Sohel sir and, uh, and uh, Salindra sir to please, uh, uh, if it's possible to share from there. Uh, has this been done, Salindra sir? Uh, no, we haven't uh, clicked on the link yet. So I would like to request uh, you to please uh, share from there, if it's possible. Not too sure. Um, just a minute, uh, Suraj. Yeah, hands in, please. Let's click. What I can say is for the for the first newsletter and the newsletter format has been a great great exercise. Very informative. So apologies go. for uh, taking a few moments here. So we will be launching our newsletter through that website also. So <clears throat> okay. So uh, this has been uh, the effort of just a, a couple of uh, weeks. So I think it will get better. So uh, this is the website. You can just scroll in, uh, Salinder sir. Sorry, Suj. Okay, someone's doing it. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this has been, I mean, we have tried to summarize our member economies in the world map. And there on the top menu bar, you can see there are uh, so many sections. Uh, if you go, if you go on to, uh, if you click on the, our team, uh, so it will uh, provide the list of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the current committee, maybe I, I think it's, it's still under uh, progress, but it will get better. So if you go to the uh, other section, yeah, here on the future leaders, on the, on the future leaders section. Uh, so there will be future leaders committee. Uh, you can click on the future leaders committee, past future leaders committee. Yeah. 
So it will uh, give us, we will keep on documenting all these practices. Now, uh, uh, to access all of our recordings that we did during our webinar, you can simply go to the videos menu. And then uh, uh, the YouTube link has also been embedded here. And uh, there's a section uh, downloads. Uh, so I will take this moment to uh, uh, request Salinder sir and Swail sir to please open this AKIC newsletter March, and this will be the official launch of our newsletter. There you go. Congratulations. Official launch of the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So and this is the first ever. Uh, sorry, sorry, sure, sure. Please. So this has incorporated different sections that includes women special and also, yeah, um, other, other components. Uh, for instance, uh, we are also collaborating with different technical committees. So as of now, we had International Women's Day on March 8th. So we requested article from uh, PICEGAD. So maybe in the days to come, we'll be uh, collaborating with uh, other technical committees. So one of our future leaders enrolled into the PhD, that study has also been prepared. And we are also sharing the different opportunities alert for the young future leaders that are available as of now. So, and we have also documented all those news uh, webinars information. So this is it, what uh, we have tried to do in a very short period of time. And maybe if you can, uh, yeah, uh, scroll down. There's a, uh, I mean, I would also like to, take this forum an opportunity to welcome in any potential um, articles for our upcoming session. So we are publishing this new newsletter on a quarterly basis. So we will be having four uh, newsletters uh, in a year. So we'll be really uh, glad to receive uh, suggestions, feedback, and also the potential, I mean, the interesting articles so that it can become a very good uh, inspiring uh, story for all of us. And this will be circulated to Every uh, future leaders, uh, and uh, we are also uh, planning to share it to our member economy so that it can be circulated in uh, other different forums as well. So yeah, this is here comes uh, to the end of our uh, launching session. So I would like to thank uh, my both of my coaches, Salindra sir and, and Sohil sir. And uh, without any further delay, now I would like to uh, uh, move towards our presentation session. So. Uh, uh, as of now, uh, for the first presentation, we have Dr. Jisoo Kim, who is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at University of Seoul. Her research interests include random heterogeneous materials, correlation analysis, uh, microstructure and property, uh, disaster prevention and uh, mitigation. Her current research focus is on 3D concrete printing from materials development to pattern optimization. And today, she'll be talking on the introduction of virtual laboratory for developing uh, building and uh, construction materials. So the floor is yours, Dr. Jishu. Yes, so thank you. Thank you for attending the presentation. Okay, so thank you. And my name is Jisoo Kim. And today I'm going to talk about the introduction of the virtual laboratory for developing the building and construction materials. And actually, I uh, would like to introduce myself, but already the Sira, thanks to introduce me. And I just want to really uh, thank you. I, I'm really happy to meet you and especially the uh, FL, uh, FLC members, even though in the, the Zoom. So I hope we can make some fruitful the activities during the term of the FLC. And this, I'd like to start with the research motivations. And if we design the structure, the structure, we uh, have to investigate the structure, the behavior uh, in the concede according to the it's the the target performance. And but the structure uh, is generally composed of the several elements. Uh, it is necessary to evaluate the response of the element. Uh, 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 to offer a better understanding of the structure behavior. But moreover, the element, is, the property of the element is significantly related to the material properties. So it is also very important to understand the material's behavior as such, and the properties of the material, such as how strong the, st the material is or how uh, well the material remain in some the extreme the, the condition. So, 
Uh, so if we determine the optimal material, the properties or the characteristics, then we can the, evaluate the response of the, each element or the member uh, more precisely. And as a result, we can predict the structure behavior or we can design the material uh, cross-section or the optimize, optimize the material, uh, the, the structure uh, for the, the, the purpose. The purpose. But this kind of the study we can call uh, the generally the multi-scale research, but today I would like to introduce the research in the material level. So this is a framework of the, the virtual laboratory work and the the main purpose of the using the virtual laboratory or the virtual experiment is to predict the material property through the virtual experimenter, uh, which is complementary to the actual experiment. But the concrete or the cement based material is the generally a typical the, the heterogeneous material and very complex the composite material. So it is uh, uh, the, the, their, the properties are significantly related to the affected and the sensitive to the uncertainty of the microstructure. Therefore, in the framework, the microstructure uh, of the cement based material is characterized using the virtual specimen, and then the material properties are evaluated through the virtual experimenter. And the correlations between the microstructure characteristics and also the material properties uh, can be the obtained and we can establish their correlation. And then at the end, we using that correlation, we can predict the new building and construction materials uh, of the, the materials, the properties. So this is the methodology. And first to characterize a microstructure, the micro CT image technique was used to, to generate the virtual specimen. And from the micro CT, uh, we can obtain the virtual specimen, which is the pore or the several the pages, but we can just identify the solid phase uh, separated from the solid. And then we can characterize the each phase the, the properties using the probabilistic method or some of the, the histogram based analysis. And then we can, uh, when we generate the virtual specimen, which has the same the microstructure of the actual specimen, we can just conduct the uh, per uh, property evaluation using the virtual experimenter, such as the finite element analysis. So we can obtain the, for example, the thermal conductivity and elasticity or the strength or the permeability. So from the microstructure characterization process, if, if we obtain the poor and solid related parameters, then we can correlate them to the modeling input parameters. And then when we decide this modeling input parameter based on the microstructure characteristics, then we can conduct the virtual experimenter to obtain the well, material properties. So for example, here we can obtain the correct patterns and also the strength or the stiffness through the virtual experiment. So when I was uh, the very first year of my the, the graduate students, uh, the one question came into my mind that what factors make, which factors make the material property different according to the mixed design? And you can find the answer from the textbook or other things, but I would like to introduce some of my, the, my own defin definition of the, the solution uh, the answer of this question uh, regarding to the, the microstructure characteristics. So for example, the first the answer of this question could be the poor distribution characteristics. For example, the porosity or the poor distribution can affect the material responses. So to investigate the, the effect of the poor distribution on the mechanical the properties, we generate the two different type of the cement paste, uh, which is the, con the insulated cement paste, which has the high thermal insulating performance. And we generate the, the cement paste with and without the glass bead. And when you see the, this the left side figure, we can see the neat cement with the less pore 
but in the, the light, right side figure, we can see the, uh, the cement paste with very lot of the pores inside the specimen. And using these two different type of the specimen, when we characterize the microstructure of the pore distribution, then we can obtain the different behavior of the pore uh, connectivity and pore continuity using the, the probability based analysis. So we, we can conclude it that the, when we using the more glass beads in the cement paste, then we can expect that the porosity, each porosity increases, not only the porosity, but also the pore connectivity and pore uh, continuity increase also. And these are these result in the decrease of the mechanical properties. And we can just find these the kind of the explanation of the reason the porosity decrease from the characterization of the microstructure. And the second answer could be the solid phase property. The solid phase property could uh, influence the, the material properties. So for example, if there's a two specimen with the same porosity and same the pore distribution, but if the material property is different, are different each other, especially the solid characteristic. So first the left side feed, the specimen has the strength uh, the much higher density, so it has a much stronger the base inside the specimen. And if the the right side uh, specimen has the 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 less the lower the density solid bases inside the specimen, then obviously the 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 response of the material differs. So based on this the concept, we can ca characterize the solid paste properties which can relate it with the modeling input parameters. But in the micro CT image, we can generally obtain the grayscale, uh, grayscale data of the spatial distribution microstructure. And from the data of the micro CT, we can just obtain the characteristic value which called the linear attenuation coefficient called the LAC. So from this LAC distribution, we can characterize the, and quantify the, the, quantify the characteristics of the solid phase using the micro CT, the based microstructure. So as an example application, uh, we generate the two different type of the formed concrete, which is uh, made for the right weights and the thermal insulating materials. So the left side, there is the formed concrete with the density around the 500 kilograms per cube meter. And the right side, there is the FC100 specimen, which is the 1000 kilogram per cube meter. Then you can see here uh, in the feed, in the FC100 specimen, there's a lot of the bright the base inside the material. It means there is a much dense base or uh, exist in the FC FC 1000 compared to the FC 500. And then when we see the poor distribution inside specimen, you can easily uh, see, you can easily uh, find and uh, confirm that the FC 500 has much more pores, large and also the small pores inside the, sp inside the specimen. And again, we just, when we draw the distribution of the LAC, which is the characteristic value of the solid basis, then we can just calculate the mean value of the LAC from the FC500 and FC100. Then we can clearly find that the, the value, mean value of the LAC is much higher in the FC100 because of higher density, the existence of the higher density properties in higher uh, property, the higher solid base, uh, the denser solid in the FC100 compared to the 500. And then from the, these kind of the characteristic value, we can correlate them with the modeling input parameters. Uh, so we can just find as the function between the, the characteristic value and the, make the modeling input parameters. So from here, when we made the new formed concrete with different mixed design or the different the, the materials, but even though we when we made the the formed concrete in the, the similar range of the density, 
then we can just find and also if we know the LA mean LAC value of the specimen, then we can find the modeling input parameters from this the correlation. And then we can just obtain the material responses uh, through the virtual experiment. So from here, we, it, whatever the material we used, we can just obtain the material response and we can predict the material uh, responses through this kind of the, the, the virtual experimental framework. And then not only for prediction of the material property, but also we can utilize this the virtual experimental tool to uh, conduct the sensitivity analysis of the material properties to microstructural characteristics. For example, we can reconstruct and we can generate the new materials, the microstructure which has uh, induced or the preferred microstructure characteristics. So when we make those, those two specimens, for example, with the same porosity, but with the different degree of the clustering, then we can just make this thing and we can find out how the clustering affects uh, the material response and how sensitive the, the mechanical properties are to the, the, the clustering, the degree of the clustering. And also when we consider the, the interfacial transition zone and transition zone ITZ or for the, uh, the, the transition zone between the aggregate and the cement paste, then we can also can evaluate the properties of the, the mortar or the concrete. So we can extend this kind of the, the working or the framework to the, 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 in the general, the construction materials. And now I'm currently working on the 3D concrete printing technology. And this is the, an example of the printing specimen. And But the big challenge of the 3D concrete printing is to develop the material which can be extruded through the 3D printer and the nozzle and which can be uh, well, the, the, which can be have enough buildability or uh, not to, to face the material failure or the buckling. So the to so in this kind of the to solve this kind of the the, uh, the problem, I just uh, use the previous the previous um, the virtual experimental tool to the 3D concrete printing technique. And for here uh, I now working on the two different label study. And first in the structural level, we can just determine or the optimize the work or the, the pattern of the printing and or in terms of the thermal or the mechanical properties. And also when you see this slide, uh, the fresh concrete changes their mechanical properties according to the time. So we have to select the the nodule speed, the printing speed, and also the width of the uh, the structure, or also the geometry, the, the whole the geometry of the printing structure. So before the actual printing, we can just uh, test this the several time through the virtual experimenter. Then we can just waste the material, and we can save some time to develop the more the accurate and optimize the, the printing structure. And in the material level. Uh, because it is a printed material, both printed, stru printed structure, and it has the layers and also the filaments. So we have to consider the anisotropy of the pore distribution inside the structure. So these the anisotropy are also very, uh, very difficult to uh, find out which effects will be uh, affected by in the the printed structure. So now I'm focusing on the analyze analyze the anisotropy pore distribution and also the bonding porosity between the interfilament, I, I mean the interfilament and in the layers. And for the, the further, this is the last slide for my talk and for the further work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for all. <laughs> 
And now I'm, I'm now working on the material discovery using the machine learning based the, the technique and also to working on the make some digital twin model for the uh, predict the property prediction. And finally, by combining these two themes and extending them, I will just uh, would like to apply this the virtual uh, the laboratory tool to the, the smartest construction the field. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jisoo Kim, for your wonderful presentation. So it was really uh, interesting to hear about uh, the works which you have been doing, and especially the works related to 3D concrete printing and so on. So I think uh, this will definitely uh, encourage our future leaders, so the, those whoever who are working on this uh, uh, work on this uh, dimension. I think they must be really motivated. So we'll be circling. I think uh, this session is recorded and we'll be sharing it to our future leaders in case if they aren't able to join today. So th that was the first uh, presentation. And uh, we'd like to now move towards our uh, second presentation. So which will be given by our deputy chair, our future leader deputy chair, Dr. Guy Byom Shin. Uh, so uh, Dr. Uh, Shin is a post uh, doctoral researcher in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at uh, Seoul National University. He completed his uh, bachelor's degree in Civil and Environmental uh, Engineering at, at, uh, at the same and earned his PhD from the same university in 2022. So his research focuses on geotechnical information systems and the design of geotechnical structures based on ground structure interaction. And for today, he will be uh, giving his insights on load transfer behavior of a load distributive compression anchor. So it's over to you, uh, Dr. Shin. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, I'm, hello, everyone. I'm Kyubom Shin. Uh, I'm currently working as a postdoctoral researcher at Seoul National University. And I'm also a deputy chair of FSC member. And I'd like to express my gratitude to be uh, an opportunity to be a FSC member. Thank you. And today I'd like to talk about the load transfer mechanism of a low distributive compression anchor, which is one type of ground anchor and has been widely used at various construction sites. Uh, the contents are as follows. Firstly, I will deal with the background and purpose of my research. And then I will explain the numerical simulation results and I will propose the design guideline of LDCA. Lastly, I will conclude my presentation by summarizing key findings. Oh. Yeah. Ground anchors uh, has been widely used at various construction sites such as retaining walls, slope stability system, and tunnels. This figure, this figure shows the retaining wall with uh, ground anchors to provide the retail resistance to against the re earth pressure acting on the wall, ground anchor transfer the load applied to the strand to the grout and surrounding ground. Therefore, for efficient design of ground anchor, it is essential to evaluate the load transfer behavior, as you can see in the right figure, uh, among the strand, grout, and ground. Depending on the load transfer behavior, uh, various types of ground anchor has been proposed uh, recently, the demand for LDCA load distributive compression anchor has increased because of high bearing capacity and remo removable able steel strand. Left figure shows the schematic diagram of LDCA. Uh, LDCA consists of multiple anchor bodies along the anchor lengths, and st strand is connected to each anchor body independently. Therefore, when the load is applied to the strand, the movement of each anchor body induces the distributed compressive stress in the grout uh, and uh, distributed grout ground shear stress. Therefore, LDCA has multiple loading points resulting in high bearing capacity. Furthermore, uh, the strength in LDCA is covered by shift tube along the entire length of anchor. Therefore, as you can see in the right figure, after the construction, the strand can be removed. This feature makes uh, LDC a popular choice for the construction project in urban area where the remaining strand can cause the environmental problem. So 
to apply the LDCA in construction sites, it is necessary to evaluate the effect of multiple anchor bodies. Similar to the group pile effect, which, generate, uh, which reduced the pile resistance due to the overlapping of stress and strain field, the independent load transfer of each anchor body in LDCA can also re induce the interference effect between adjacent anchor body. Therefore, uh, in this presentation, I'd like to share the numerical simulation results and discuss the load transfer behavior of LDCA. Uh, before the numerical simulation, I conduct a series of PURA field tests in the weather rock condition, and I use the field test result to propose the numerical simulation model. Uh, Abacus 2D exasymmetry mo model was applied to simulate each component of LDCA, and constitutive model of each component were applied with linear elastic model for anchor body and grout, and a walk long model for ground condition. The material property of each component was selected based on the in-situ test and laboratory test. Uh, the material property of each component can be su was summarized in the table. Uh, to simulate the load transfer behavior of LDCA, it is so important to adopt a proper interface model. For the grout ground interface, I used the clunk friction model and allowable slip and friction coefficient were determined by comparing the simulation results with field test results. And allowable slip of 0 0.25, friction coefficient of 1.6 uh, show the minimum RMC value indicating that this coefficient can simulate the interface behavior, behavior at the grout and weather rock condition. Furthermore, for the anchor body and grout, traction separation model was applied and simulation results were compared with the field test results. And tensile stiffness K sub N of 10 to the sixth power shows the minimum value indicating that traction separation model can simulate the tensile stress and the tensile uh, force generate between the anchor body and the grout. This result shows the results of applying interface coefficient to all field test results. And uh, grout texture load measured by the field test results uh, and uh, grout texture load distribution then estimated by the numerical simulation has similar value for the all field test condition. Uh, this indicates that the proposed model can simulate the load transfer behavior of LDCA. The ground texture load has the peak value at the location of each anchor body and decreased toward the anchor head because of the ground ground shear stress. Using the proposed model, I evaluate the effect of multiple anchor bodies and anchor body spacing. This figure shows the ground texture load and the right figure shows the ground, ground shear stress. When comparing the double anchor body conditions with single anchor body, the ground texture load decreased while the ground, ground shear stress increased. This means that the movement of upper anchor body uh, generates the tensile force and additional ground, ground shear stress to the lower anchor body. This pan, in the interference phenomenon became more significant as the anchor body spacing decreased. And this page shows the effect of anchor lengths. Uh, in the, when, the anchor length, when the anchor length is, was longer, no significant interference effect occurred. However, uh, in the, when the anchor length was shorter, like nine meter and eight meter, larger breadth of ground texture load is shown in the red, uh, and tensile force is shown in the blue, or cold in the grouts. Therefore, it can be said that, that in the LDCA, it is possible to generate the compression or tensile failure in the grout of short anchor lengths. This graph shows the grout ground shear stress with the interface shear strengths. And you can see the when the overlapping of grout texture load occurred, 
The ground, ground interface failure were generated at the entire length of grout of lower anchor body, the first anchor body. Uh, conversely, the, when the tensile force occurred in the grout, grout ground interface failure was developed at the entire grout of second uh, upper anchor body. From these results, uh, it can be said that the local failure at the grout ground interface induces the excessive slip transferring a large grout actual load at, to the other anchor body. In this presentation, I uh, try to find the, the effect of multiple anchor bodies on the ultimate bearing capacity of LDCA. Following the current design practice, the ultimate bearing capacity of LDCA can be calculated as the minimum value of tensile failure load of strength and compressive failure load of grout and grout ground interface failure. Uh, considering the field test condition, I calculate the tensile failure load of strength and compressive failure load of grout. And below figure shows the uh, tensile failure load and compressive failure load depending on the number of anchor body. As you can see, uh, it can be concluded that the LDCA ultimate bearing capacity is determined by the uh, compressive failure load of grout. Furthermore, the grout ground interface failure load can be calculated by integrating the shear strain along the anchor length and grout ground interface failure load increased with the length of anchor. Uh, this table, this figure shows the safety condition estimated by the current, current design practice. And uh, when the design load is 400 kilonewton, double anchor body should be applied and the length of anchor body should be designed be, to be more than 6.02 meter. In order to evaluate the effect of multiple anchor bodies on ultimate bearing capacity, I perform a series of numerical simulation again and the applied load causing a compressive or tensile failure of the grout was evaluated. And as you can see, the grout failure, which cannot be predicted in, with the current design method was observed. And therefore to prevent the ground fail, grout failure by the interference effect, the anchor length should be increased. Lastly, I will wrap up my presentation with conclusion. Uh, in this presentation, the interface coefficient for simulating on LDCA were evaluated. And by using the proposed model, I evaluate the effect of number and uh, spacing and the total length of anchor. Uh, in the multiple anchor bodies, the effect, interference effect between adjacent anchor body caused a decrease of ground texture load and an increase of ground ground shear stress. And a local failure at the grout ground interface can cause the compressive or tensile failure in the grouts. And for the design guideline of LDCA, the ultimate bearing capacity of LDCA was evaluated by based on the current design practice and multiple anchor bodies with short anchor lengths caused the grout failure, which cannot be predicted by the current design method. Therefore, finally, I propose the design guideline, design length of LDCA, which can prevent the interference effect between the anchor bodies. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sin. So thank you for presenting your test results and numerical stimulation results uh, that were performed by you and your team. And also, definitely, load uh, LDCA are uh, very important to uh, you know uh, because because of their high bearing capacity and their ability to remove uh, steel strands after construction. So yeah, it has been emerging. And thank you for sharing your insights. And uh, Dr. Sin is also the uh, coordinator for this uh, Muse's letter preparation. So he has also uh, contributed a lot to this. Uh, so I would like to thank him again. And now it's turn for our uh, uh, third presentation. So we had uh, two future leaders from KSC doing it in person, and uh, and the third presentation will be uh, virtual. So, uh, is it possible for you to share your slides, Engineer Charles Vishwaye?
So uh, our third presenter will be engineer Charles Sushuai, uh, who is from Federation of Myanmar Engineering Societies. Uh, and uh, engineer I is working as a technical assistant engineer at engineering department at Yagan City Development uh, Committee and also a visiting lecturer at STI Myanmar University. So her education background is Master's of Engineering, uh, Water Resources and Bachelor's of Civil Engineering. So today so we will be talking uh, about the overview about Water 4.0. So I, uh, the stage is yours, Engineer Cha. You can proceed. Thank you, Suresh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Chosu Su A from Myanmar, Federation of Myanmar Engineering Society. Uh, today, I would like to present about overview of WADA 0.0. Water 4.0 is a concept that has recently been raised as the future of the water industry possibly. So to define what exactly water 4.0, we have to look at industry 4.0. So what is industry 4.0? It is a collected term for technologies and concepts of balloon chain organization. Based on the technological concerns on cyber physical system, the Internet of Things, IoT, and the Internet of Services, it facilitates the vision of the smart factory. So, uh, Industry 4.0 is based upon six design principles. Uh, the first is interoperability. Uh, this is the availability of cyber physical system, human and smart factory to connect and communicate with each other by the IoT and the Internet of Services. And uh, the second is visualization. Uh, this is the virtual copy of the smart factory, which is created by linking sensor data from monitoring physical process with virtual plan model and simulation model. And then decentralization. Uh, this is the availability of cyber physical system with smart factory to make decisions on their own. And then the and then uh, the real time capability. This is the capability to collect and analyze data and provide the insights immediately. And service orientation. Uh, this is the offerings of services of cyber physical system, human and smart factory by the Internet of Services. And the last one is modularity, uh, flexible adaptation of smart factory for changing requirement of individual modules. So the cyber physical system CPS element of this can be defined as a system of collaborating communication element and controlling physical identities. Cyber mm -hmm. physical systems are physical and engineering systems whose operations are monitored, coordinated, controlled, and integrated by a community and communication pool. So, this allows us to add capability to physical systems by merging community and communication with physical processes. Excuse me, I, could you uh, uh, present it in the slideshow? Yeah, change, change the slideshow. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Oh. Uh, you can carry on. Uh, now, uh, now you all can see my slide. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. So, uh, so application to the water industry. Uh, for the industry, it is a relatively simple. Something is being fabricated and put together utilizing this tank bed. Uh, but for the water industry, it is actually quite different. Be it potable water or waste water, it is being cleaned for discharge either to the customer, tech, or back to the environment. So in reality, operationally, does industry 4.0 apply to the water industry or are we trying to force concept from another industry onto the water industry and creating something that doesn't quite work? So let's play around the design principle briefly and see where we get and see how far the industry is with this concept. So the first one is interoperability. The availability of water industry operator to connect communicate and work with the treatment, collection, and distribution system. 
to find out what is going on and be able to connect remotely. So if you ignore the concerns of doing this over the internet, it is unproven that we already have the availability to do through the SCADA system. So in some way, you can almost say that the water industry has achieved this on large streamer work and in some aspect with distribution system. However, we are nowhere near the interoperability concept of smaller treatment work and collection system. So as for the rating of interoperability, we can say yes, at least in part of the industry. And the second one is visualization. Uh, this is the virtual copy of the smart factory. At first, with what the treatment work have process model that control aspect of human work and import advanced distribution and collection system. We even had model based simulation model. So it is certain that the technology is not quite there yet on a company wide basis, but in pocket in the water industry, it certainly work and is in place. So the rate for the visualization, it can be said that not far off. And the third one is decentralization. Uh, this is the availability of the treatment work and network system to control themselves. We as an industry have elements of treatment work that are more than capable of controlling themselves through monitoring and control system. So we have permission that based upon the signal from level control where control pass for work. So we have program level logistics controller, PSC, and these are added as a control center for treatment Wall or individual part of the treatment wall. So as for the rating for this decentralization, we can say yes, a bit perhaps. And the fourth one is a real-time capability. This is the capability to collect and analyze data and provide the insights immediately. And I wonder, and I wonder four point zero, the principles of visualization and decentralization, the system should react itself. So this is the potential for real-time or even near-time capability as applicable to the industry. But to be fair, this is an area where the water industry could create itself as an area of improvement. So uh, as for the rating for the real-time capability, we can say that this is an area for improvement. And the fifth one is service orientations. Water meters are mostly manually read once or twice a year. Customer based and other customer communication are mostly paper based and come through the email. Through some communication is also through the social media. So customer queries are handed over the telephone. Auto text messages, social media, and testing to mobile phone are becoming non popular. So customer analytics are rare at best. Although with the advance of smart metering, this is an area that the industry is actively pressured in improving in. So as for the rating, this service orientation, this is an area where the improvement are being made, but generally we could do better. And the last one is modularity. If you look at some large wastewater treatment for the design finance settlement tank of the same size, the same shape, and only vary in number. So the control system of individual tank will be exactly the same as the control system for the tank next door to it. So has the water industry achieved the design principles of modularity? I agree with me. Perhaps certainly not across the whole industry. But perhaps not if you are going to take a first view of industry 4.0, but draw a view of water 4.0, it is a definite maybe. So as for the rating of modularity, it is getting there. Delivering to water 4.0, if a water 4.0 is to pick a true reality in the water industry, then as a sign to define the information that the water industry needs to operate and must be completed. Now, from the information requirement can the data need, and from this instrumentation, there is required to feed the data need. So at this level, sensors and control management system are needed, as well as data validation system to check on the quality of the data that is collected. So it is the sensors and control layer that is absolutely vital if the water industry is to deliver to water 4.0. 
For the water industry, uh, there are numerous different elements from the water industry telemetry standard to the existing standard and PSC structure. The main concern and the main stemming flow of water 4.0 is within the layer of water industry and concern digital cyber security. So the telemetry system layer when all of the data from census and control layer is collected, point also including PSCs and supervisory control and data administration SCADA system. So uh, water 4.0, it is something for the water industry. If so, how far along the path are we? The quick answers are that it is something for the water industry and in large part, we have been moving toward it for a number of years. As an industry, we are moving farther and farther toward a factory approach to the product that we produce. Whether it is potable water for drinking, treated water for returning to the environment or to be used on the agricultural land. More and more, we are seeing product factory minimization of losses through leakage, reduction, and maximization of product that we can produce through resource recovery. We as an industry are focused on providing the best customer service that we can. Hence, most commonly are metering the water they provide. And in large number of cases, this is through smart metering to work with the customer to provide the best customer services. So water 4.0, the smart water industry is central to the way of working and it is through the development of the design principles of industry 4.0 that we can deliver the future of water industry. However, there are some barriers to this approach to take into account and some decisions that need to be made, not on a company level, but in real terms of an industry level as a whole. The first of this area is that communication protocol. And so far as we are industry, this is mainly working for analog signal in the main, and the industry seems to be headed toward a future of internet. And the second is cyber security, uh, which is becoming an increasingly urgent issue. For those talking about cloud of internet of the environment, the proof of absolute security is an absolute mess. So incidents of hacking water treatment for which have hit results new, along with best incident, only made the issue of all more important. The impact of a hacking incident that chain chemical level can have serious implications to consumer or the environment. And zero risk must be the way forward for the water industry to even investigate this area. And the third is instrumentation and data quality. Uh, this is an end to data recent information property. The water industry has a vast amount of instruments which produce a vast amount of data that give no actionable intelligence and in reality need to move toward an era of simply information richness. Uh, uh, this needs to be a create which requires a correct instrumentation to be purchased, installed, operated, and maintained correctly. This is not always the case in the water industry of today, as the value of data and information is relatively low. Whatever, uh, Water 4.0 is something that the water industry should be aiming to work. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Charles Desai. So uh, I think it has also like cited to one of the session yesterday, like uh, it was a very enlightening question yesterday. Uh, will uh, will the water be enough for like uh, increasing 2 billion population in, over, in about like 250 or 270? So I think uh, this has also given some insights to that. And also uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, uh, sharing some of the smarter, uh, sustainable and innovative approach to water and management. Uh, by the use of obviously the technologies, uh, the Internet of Things and so on. So I think that ha this is uh, really interesting. So yeah, here we come to the end of the uh, presentation from our three uh, future leaders. And now I would like to move on to the uh, Q&A session. So for this Q&A session, uh, we have uh, engineer uh, Madison Elliott uh, who will be assisting us uh, for this Q&A. So uh, maybe uh, Maddie, it's up to you now. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Suraj. And thank you to our three speakers that we had today. Um, I really enjoyed our presentations and I think it's great that we get to share the different technical elements that the future leaders of each of the member countries are working on. 
Uh, as we are doing this as a hybrid event, I would like to call on someone in the room as well, if there is someone available to facilitate questions um, from anyone on the in-person audience. Medicine, this is Shalandra, I'll help. Okay, thank you, Shalandra. Uh, and then for those online, if you could use the chat box function to ask questions, uh, and then we'll direct those to the uh, relevant speaker. Uh, if anyone is also online, feel free to unmute and ask the question if you'd like to uh, ask it yourself. Uh, we do have a question from Suraj. Uh, this is in regards to our first speaker on the 3D concrete printing. Uh, so do you think the 3D concrete printing will contribute towards more eco-friendly construction? Thank you for the question. And I think, yes, it could be, but the problem is when we made the, the 3D concrete printing, we use a lot of the chemical admixture to, to, to make some of the flowability or the buildability in now the current state. But I think for the later, we can just replace some cement to the other, like the clay or some other the eco-friendly materials. Then we can make some of the, um, like the better the material uh, in the concrete, it's really concrete printing field, I guess, and I hope, yeah. Excellent, thank you for your response and thank you, Suraj, for the question. Was there any questions in the room? Not yet, Maddie. Okay, we have one. Uh, <clears throat> hello, yes, my name is Weda Tamon from JC. Uh, again, my question to the uh, Dr. G. Su Kim. Y yes, in fact, uh, your presentation is very interesting. And uh, your methodology and the interest is very similar to my research interest. And uh, one of my PhD students is doing very similar. You presented the uh, foam concrete. Yeah, that is very interesting. <laughs> then my question is very uh, technical specific question. Uh, in your simulation, uh, the, uh, what is the uh, size of the model? Yes, micro level or me, yeah. And it has the like the 2000, uh, 200, 200, 200 box cell. And for the foam concrete, we have to uh, the make the bigger specimen, larger specimen, because we the, there's a lot of the pores and, and the foams inside. So we have to uh, meet and satisfy the, the representative, the volume. So yeah, yeah. So actually for the foam concrete, we use the, the specimen around the, as I remember, the, the less than the two centimeter or something like that. So I think for the, when we focus on the voxel side, it is the micro level, but for the whole specimen, it is some of the. the uh, in your simulation, you also try to simulate the mechanical property as well? No, uh, yes. Yeah. Then, if you have the different scale, the material model, it could be different from the uh, macro scale material model. How do you identify your material model? Yeah, so this is kind of the size effect of the, the simulation and of the material that of course we have to, to figure out how will affect the size effects effect on the material side. But for this 
simulation, we generally compare, it is not easy to compare the, the, the actual experimental result to the simulation, but we found some of the, the mechanism or some of the, the test method to, to, to compare the very the small size the specimen. Yeah, so we used to that then or for the, in other aspect, we can just assign the material properties obtained from the nano indentation or the micro, the micro the indentation. So it's, we just assume that the material that the assigned the material properties for the simulation uh, could be the very the the similar to the micro label material. We have to solve that. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I think I need to communicate with you. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you for that question uh, in person. We do have another question for engineer Cho Susu Ai. Uh, Water 4.0 is an interesting concept. Um, how is it implemented? And can you share any of the pilots or implementations that are currently being carried out in Myanmar? Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, in Myanmar, uh, we are uh, we are practicing all of the we are practicing just a practice and not all about completing. Yeah. yeah, we are trying and uh, trying to deliver to water four point zero for the smart water industry for the community. Yeah, yeah there's no all. I love project, that's why. Thank you for your question. Just a follow up question on that one from myself. Is there any particular countries that you're using as an example for the water 4.0? Um, and if so, uh, how are these countries implementing it? And uh, uh, this is the uh, in the UK, they are also already practicing in the water 4.0. Yeah, in the UK. Great, thank you. Thank you. Maddie, we have a question in the room from Secretary General of Desing. Yes, the question, the question, the question is for uh, Dr. Kim again. Um, in, in the United States, we have been uh, looking at coming up with greenhouse gas neutral building materials like cement and concrete. Have you been taking care of uh, measuring in your new materials, what effect it would have in terms of greenhouse gases, whether you have uh, uh, zero or net positive, net negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the materials uh, that you're using for, for building cement and other things. <laughs> You mean the, I'm not sure I understand very well, but you mean the, the, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for that, I actually have some of the experience to do some LCC analysis using some, some new material, which uh, I went and we just want to the compare the LCC and the emission of the CO2 of the, the normal concrete and the concrete with the mark clay. In the case, yeah, we can just compare to the which material could be much eco-friendly, or we can just uh, uh, get more like the super the cons construction material, which can reduce the CO two emission by reducing the the the, the cement amount to used. But actually, from my simulation. It is not possible to measure that, but anyway, we can just apply another the the methodology to to calculate the the effect. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
irrigation and agriculture. Uh, if there was any particular case studies that uh, are available for reference on minor irrigation product uh, projects using the application of water 4.0. Yes, uh, I would uh, like to reference for the water 4.0 boat. Uh, this is included in my presentation in reference slides. I will share this. Okay, excellent. Yes, so we'll make the slides available yeah. as well for people's um, for. Uh, I would like to reference this boat. In this boat, there is uh, the same ASM phase of utilization in the UK. Uh, this is the water 4.0 past, present, and future of the world. Uh, most vital resources by David okay. uh, And now I would like to uh, reference this book uh, to, to, study, uh, to study some of the projects. I, I can share this about wine data. Uh, maybe Great. we have a question in the room. Okay, excellent. Uh, my name is Moon Kyung uh, of KSC. I guess I'm the only geotechnical engineer in this room, except that Dr. Shin, uh, who just presented his PhD dissertation. And uh, ASC, I'm sorry, ASAC, uh, this platform, uh, I believe that uh, has a tendency to be more interested in the bigger picture, like uh, carbon neutrality, or you know, future stuff like a virtual labs or water policies for the future. You talked about the core geotechnical engineering stuff. Nothing's wrong with that. Cheer up, okay? I had a chance personally. Uh, his study. Uh, during his uh, PhD study from his advisor. And then if I remember correctly, and then you said the uh, compressive strength of the grout determines that the capacity of the anchor. Am I correct? Uh, is it true for the old ground conditions? Uh, your thesis um, assumes that the ground condition is, is weather rock. What if it is this, uh, uh, heavily weathered rock or the more softer ground. Oh yeah. Firstly, I apologize for my presentation. <laughs> In the next time, I will prepare the future works that I will going to do. And, <laughs> and the 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 uh the from now. From the results that I conducted previously, it was find that it was found that the the interference effect was determined by the local failure between the grout and ground, which means that it is interference effect can be larger or can can, can be more significant in the soft ground condition like clay or sand something like that and to prevent that kinds of interference effect in the soft ground condition, especially, we have to find the general design guideline, not that kinds of ankle lengths we have to prove. I think the final goal of my, goal of my research is to be the present the design guideline for the LDCA, like design the space spacing of the ankle body, something like that, to provide more accumulate, uh, accumulate accurate uh, ultimate bearing capacity or improve the high ultimate bearing capacity, something like that. Yeah. Eddie, have you got any online? I have a question for all three speakers. Yes, feel free, Shalendra. Okay. Um, so Dr. Shin and Dr. Kim and engineer A. I, um, we have a lot of seniors here, a lot of mentors in the room and you in your own organizations. Um, I'd like one minute response from each in terms of your experience, uh, help from your mentors, whether it's academic or industry or government. Was there any, uh, did you consult with anyone? Was there anyone helping you in your projects? For example, me and my colleague, engineer A, you know, she's looking for, we have colleagues from me and my in the room here. 
I mean, I'm sure when they go back, they will be helping uh, engineer A. So maybe I'll ask uh, engineer A, you can start your response first in terms of your experience and maybe what you want to see. Is engineer A there? Uh, yes, just on mute if trying to talk at the moment. Perhaps we'll ask uh, Dr. Shin or Dr. Kim in the room. Okay, we go to. Maybe the question is a bit difficult with the seniors here, but feel free to comment. We are here to help. Don't have a comment. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, following this, we were going to ask Shalendra if you had any quick remarks, um, but I'm going to take that as yours in the essence of time. I also wanted to ask our other ACAC uh, Future Leader Forum leader, uh, Mr. Sohal, if he had any final remarks uh, before going to our chair. Okay, over to Suraj. No worries. Ah, uh, yes. If Suraj, if you would be happy to close out this technical session. Oh yeah. Final remarks from Salender, then maybe we can. Uh, wrap up because it's already about to, you know, uh, the time is already uh, up there. So maybe a, a quick remarks. Uh, Salinder, sir, you'd like to mention about the, the FLF technical seminar or any, any piece of advice for us? Okay, no, no, I think um, just on behalf of Sahil, I'd like to thank him for his effort firstly uh, in the last few years. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly I think, thank you very much for the presenters. Very good presentations on time. Um, I think uh, I like the slides. Uh, I think, firstly, thank you very much for the speakers. And feel free, uh, you know, you, we got to work with you guys. So you're the future, AKEC, and uh, so we have to work with you. But certainly, I think from my point of view, thank you very much for everyone who's attended here today. There's a lot of, lot of colleagues in the room. Um, it's great that we have released the newsletter. It's, it's a great um, initiative, and I think it will inform future leaders. Um, um, I just... Um, yeah, when I finish, I'll just give Uday a minute to. Um, the other thing is the website. Very good suggestion, very good initiative. Uh, I think the colleagues in the room are surprised uh, and, and very pleased to see what you've done. We may be also able to assist the ACAC website improvement uh, based, on the, based on what you have there. Um, so with that, I think, you know, with the working groups um, um, and also uh, I think... Um, I could say that the activity report prepared and presented was very good. So all in all, you know, you guys are moving leaps and bounds. So with that, congratulations uh, to everyone. And uh, I will just, just uh, if you don't mind, Suraj, uh, the Secretary General Uday Singh will just have sure. one minute. Yeah, just, just quickly, uh, I'm using the opportunity while all of you young leaders, uh, future leaders are here. Uh, I, I'm inviting all of you to look at your interests and look at the technical committees we have under uh, ASEC. And we've, we have some new committees also that just got formed either at this ECM or the last one. Please look at, look at them and see where you want to, uh, to, to interact with. So I'm inviting you, the young future young leaders, to be members of those TCs. Those TCs are not just for senior leaders like, like us. They, they are, you know, they are for, for all of us, including the future leaders. So please uh, raise your hand, ask the TC chairs, or, or, or get uh, 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 the uh, engineer Shalendra Ram to, to help you with that, or, or send me an email and I'll get you connected 
and uh, so you can become members of those DCs. I'm looking forward to your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Um, I think one last request. So if everyone online uh, can turn the cameras on, and uh, we might get uh, Dr. Shin and, and Dr. Kim uh, up in the front here, we might take a photo with uh, the ECM chair and the Secretary General myself, who stand in the front here. Um, actually, I'll just see uh, my colleague Sohil Bashir on the screen. Sohil, uh, you want to say any last one minute? Thank you, Shalindra. Uh, first of all, congratulations to FLF for arranging a wonderful webinar and very good participation. Look forward for their continued success in all their future endeavors and uh, uh, hopefully everything will proceed as we plan. And we have, we, I'm really proud that I feel that we are in safe hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, so. Thank you very much. Okay, that is the end of the session. We'll just call the ECM chair and Secretary General and the two speakers and everyone else on the line, please turn your camera on and yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant, yeah. So those pictures on the screen stays on. So, Mahmoud, are you there? Nizam, if you could turn on the video. Purnima as well. I just saw you uh, sharing the video. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We have uh, Dr. Bizet as well. So, welcome, Dr. Bizet, uh, to our committee. <clears throat> Okay, the future leaders, you're looking well, all looking well. Thank you very much. That's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.